The year was 1968. The Vietnam War raged on. Liberal uprisings took hold in Czechoslovakia. The civil rights movement intensified. Across the globe, people cried out for radical change. In the US, these cries rang out across many college campuses as students pushed for civil rights and demanded an end to the Vietnam War and the draft. These sentiments translated into activism and demonstrations, many of which ended in violence. Such was the case at Columbia University in April 1968. In February 1968, Columbia University began construction on an $11.6 million gymnasium in Morningside Park, part of the Harlem neighborhood that houses Columbia's main campus in New York City. Almost immediately, there was objection. Students and activists argued the gym discriminated against Harlem residents by evicting and displacing them to build the structure. The gym would be built with a main entrance that catered to students and university affiliates. But local Harlem residents, many of whom were black, could use part of the facilities, but would have to enter through a back door in the basement. Many interpret this as segregation and racism. Among the gym's fiercest opponents was Columbia's Student Afro-American Society, founded in 1964. Members of the SAS labeled the construction project Jim Crow, and enlisted help from other black activists in the Harlem community and throughout New York. While the SAS worked to halt construction of the gym, another campus organization, Students for a Democratic Society, or the SDS, was building a case against the university's apparent involvement in the Vietnam War. In 1967, one SDS member, Bob Feldman, found documents in the school library showing ties between the university and a think tank involved in weapons research for the U.S. Department of Defense known as the Institute for Defense Analyses, or IDA. Many saw this as the university directly supporting the war in Vietnam. In the spring of 1968, the SDS, led by then-chairman Mark Rudd, organized a rally against the university. Their rallying cry? Students would not attend a university that exploited black people and developed weapons designed to kill the Vietnamese. On April 23, 1968, several hundred Columbia students gathered in front of Lowe Memorial Library, the university's main administrative building. They attempted to take their message inside to University President Grayson L. Kirk, but the administration locked the building down. So the group marched to the gymnasium construction site and tore down part of the fencing that surrounded it. The police moved to disperse the crowd, arresting one student in the process. Then, protesters staged a sit-in at an administrative building, preventing Dean Henry Coleman from leaving his office. They presented a list of six demands. Two included stopping construction on the gym and severing ties with the IDA. The students promised not to leave until their demands were met. The students eventually released Dean Coleman the next day, but their numbers had grown upwards of 400. They took over the Lowe Library and three additional buildings on campus. Students and community members sympathetic to the cause brought food and other supplies. The university tried to negotiate an end to the standoff over the next several days, but the administration refused to promise amnesty to the protesters and no agreement was reached. Over the course of the week, the numbers of protesters grew until finally on April 30th, police acting on orders from school president Kirk moved in and forcefully cleared all five buildings. Amid the chaos, more than 100 students, faculty members, and police were injured, and 712 students were arrested. Motivated by the actions of the police, thousands of Columbia students went on strike, and the campus shut down for the rest of the semester. The university's June commencement ceremony was held off campus instead of at its traditional location on Low Plaza. More than 300 graduating students walked out in protest to hold their own counter commencement ceremony. Eventually, Columbia University met the protesters' major demands. Gym construction was permanently suspended, and the school ended its relationship with the IDA. 
Colombia also began to revise long-established and long-criticized policies and formed a university senate. And after resisting numerous requests for his resignation, University President Kirk announced his retirement before the beginning of the next school year. In 1968, the Columbia protests were just one example of our nation grappling with injustices at home and abroad. And others caught on, validated by what many saw as legitimate and successful means of expressing grievances Demonstrations spread to hundreds of schools and cities around the world.